UK VT Rocks and my guest today is Tom Ward and you are Mr. Honey and Nuts. I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> you want to explain that? Sure. Um, I've been a beekeeper for 37 years, not every year, uh -huh. but uh, I started 37 years ago. So I got started before the Varroa mite mm -hmm. fiasco that uh, we're all dealing with now. So I kind of remember the good old days when it was right. a very simple thing to keep honeybees and have been all the way through the process. And in just the last four years, I've decided that I'm going to try a different route and not try to treat my bees for mites, try mm -hmm. to uh, develop bees or find bees that can handle these varroa mites on mm -hmm. their own. Treatment-free beekeeping is what it's called. And um, I'm definitely of the opinion that every beekeeper has his own philosophy. There's <laughs> as many ways to keep honeybees as there are beekeepers. I agree, so <laughs> totally. So I would <laughs> never suggest that <laughs> my way is the only way but it's what works for me or what I want to try to do. And that's have, to have a sustainable apiary yeah. where I don't have to buy bees every year. Right. And if I produce some honey, fine, but it's not my main goal. My main goal is to keep the bees alive through All the right. winter. Honeybee health, I think, would be the yeah, best Yeah, I'm way. a recovering beekeeper, uh, which means for the last two years, I haven't had bees, but I did for several years before that. It is, it's hard for bees up here, but clearly there are bees and they're not just the ones that we go out and buy in a packet and stick in a hive. And the most success I had with bees were the so-called feral bees. Oh. I had an empty hive and they moved in. They were wonderful. Your I think the third person, yeah, that I've um, talked to in the area mm -hmm. who's had exactly the same thing happen. Yeah, and I didn't mess with them. They were, they were peaceful bees. I mean, they were not going to kill me as I walked by or looked at the hive. But they were doing fine on their own. I didn't need to take their honey or do anything else. I left them to their own devices. And they stayed maybe three years ah. and then they were gone yeah. and I didn't find bee corpses so I don't think it was colony collapse yeah I'm very hopeful um, I've been putting up swarm traps for the last five years mm -hmm. and this year was the first year that I had some success and I've been increasing every year two four six eight I think I'm up to eleven now that I have out in various places, mm -hmm. and I compare it to the fur trapper's trap line, <laughs> and also to the um, but fisherman's. But yours is positive. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. It's very positive, and also to the fisherman with his favorite fishing hole. Yeah. So I don't uh, easily disclose where I'm placing these traps. And nor should you. <laughs> Especially since I was successful this year. In July, mm -hmm. um, I, let's see, I found the bees on, I think it was about the middle of July, but I'm expecting they moved in near the first part of July. So that's right. good, right around midsummer. And also the location is so remote that I really think they are feral bees. And I had been told that there were feral bees on this mm -hmm. particular mountain. Uh, steep slopes, probably a lot of it never logged. Yeah. So big old trees that might provide the Shelter. habitat yeah, right. for uh, bees to move into a hollow tree for them to live in. And um, just uh, anecdotal reports that people had seen wild hives in yeah. trees on this mountain. So um, mid-July go and here's all these bees coming and going with pollen on their legs and I open it up and I had a couple of um, old frames of comb in the uh, mm -hmm. box, and they were full of brood, and they had the, the bees had built comb down from the top all the way to the bottom, so they had built uh, their own comb yeah. and hanging inside the lid. 
Um, and I, once I got it into a box at home, uh, this big, robust queen, and they've just been going like gangbusters. So I'm very hopeful that these are feral bees yeah. that have learned how to live with the mites, right. are well adapted to the climate, mm -hmm. and likely to overwinter. Um, and that, to me, is the, the gold standard. That's, that's been my goal, is to try and find these feral yeah, bees. Yeah, and as an approach, it makes sense to me. I mean, the, the, the civilized, ultra-domesticated, where we treat for everything, does not seem to be a strategy that's working well. I started here in Vermont with a typical um, five-frame nucleus colony that I right. bought from a local producer mm -hmm. who, you know, I'm not criticizing anyone right. that does this, but um, they were brought up from Georgia, yep. <laughs> and although they are from a race of bees, Carniolian, mm -hmm. that is supposed to be well adapted to our climate, and right. I don't think it's the climate that makes it challenging right. in Vermont to keep bees, it's, it's the parasitic mite. But anyway, it, uh, it failed, and my wife said to me, so honey, you bought bees that were intended to be treated for mites, and then you didn't treat for mites, and now you're surprised that they died? <laughs> uh, I see what you mean. So I decided, that's when I decided to take a different approach. Yeah. And, and I, one of the best sources of information I've had is it's just like word of mouth, but it's a Facebook group uh, called Treatment Free Beekeeping, mm -hmm. and there's actually, I'm, I'm on two of them, and then there's another one all about catching swarms. Yes. So that's where I've gotten most of my information, and it's just been a wealth of information, all the shared ideas that folks have. So just as an example, it, the, the, um, what I've done is, is, a, is a classic paradigm shift, and I used to wonder what that term meant, but <laughs> everything that I used to do in beekeeping pretty much has changed. So where I used to keep bees for the products that I would get, the honey, mm -hmm. the beeswax, we even uh, collected pollen at times. Right. I don't care very much anymore at all about that. I'll, we'll take a little honey now and then. But my goal is to raise bees. And I've heard often you can either make honey or raise bees, but you really can't do both. You, mm -hmm. you, if you're going to make honey, you're not going to be so focused on uh, honeybee health and getting through the winter. Right. On the other hand, if you're focused on uh, honeybee health and getting through the winter, you're not going to get as much honey. And I've decided not to take the honey in the fall, right. but to take the surplus I find in the spring, mm -hmm. which is going to be less. But That was what we did. Yeah. And I don't feed sugar. These are all things I used to do, mm -hmm. but I don't feed sugar. I leave the honey for the bees. I let the bees build their own comb. So instead of starting with a pre-pressed um, starter strip or mm -hmm. uh, foundation, right. I let the bees build the comb down from the top of mm -hmm. the frame. Now, Which you have to be... much thicker. Yeah, and it's yeah. their size. They pick the size of right. cell that they want instead right. of being forced into something that I've decided <laughs> to put on there. Just like so, humans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's a little bit dicey. You have to kind of watch it because the frame will be loose at first until mm -hmm. they get it fully filled right. out but it lets them decide how and where they want to build their comb so the this approach has been called natural beekeeping mm -hmm. is another way of, of describing it but my like i say my main goal is to get them through the winter it's so exciting to me to have a warm day in february by warm i mean maybe 40 50 degrees that's warm and the bees flying. Flying around. And right. then first Cleaning. thing in the spring, that first really warm day, 70 degrees, they're just boiling out Everywhere. of the hive and going to work, yeah. you know. To get them through the winter is just a thrill. Yeah, because there's not much for them food-wise out there at that point. No. So my whole approach to beekeeping has completely changed. What kind of hive do you use? Oh, I'm, I'm on in the typical Langstroth uh, okay. boxes. And it would be interesting to try everybody it tells me that um, the long uh, boxes and uh, they do interest me I haven't yeah. done it but they're yeah. really intriguing uh, my challenge is I'm just so heavily invested in <laughs> the uh, Langstroth boxes that uh, you it would make be a your challenge. own in fact I had some success um, 
I, I uh, switched from the typical um, locally obtained uh, five frame nuke yeah. to Russian bees. Mm -hmm. I went to, I drove down to Massachusetts and got Russian bees. And I got them through the winter. I, I started with two. I probably split two aggressively and built up to five. Mm -hmm. No, seven that first year. Yeah. Five of the seven made it through the winter, and I thought, I've got this figured out. And I built those five up to 11, mm -hmm. but then they all crashed. I, uh. And I noticed, I knew I had something wrong, something going on that wasn't good. Um, I could see the deformed wing virus. I, I could see bees at the front of the hive that had yeah. the deformed wing virus that the varroa mites yeah. transmit. And so I knew I had a problem. But I really didn't know what to do. People told me later if I could have quarantined that hive, moved it off somewhere, mm -hmm. and separated it from the others. Yeah. But I had them all together. Not only did they have, have them all in a fairly small uh, bee yard, but I pushed them all together into clusters of four to share the warmth right. for the winter. I've done that. And I don't think that was a good idea. So the short story is they all crashed. And it was varroa mites. Mm -hmm. I could see the mites. So where I thought I had resistant bees because of good genetics from right. the Russian bees and I used Saskatraz and others that were supposed to be good it at dealing with so. the, the mites. Yeah, it didn't turn out to, yeah. to be How so. How many hives do you have currently? Two. Um, the one that I caught in yeah. July and then I, for the first time I got a swarm call where I was actually able to get there on time. I've probably had swarm calls, I probably had three or four every summer, only yeah. three or four, because, and I've tried to get the word out everywhere, if you see a swarm, call me. Right. Um, but up until this summer, every time I get a call, by the time I could get there, they were gone. Right. So, but this time they were still there, so I did get a swarm. And the fella that uh, called me, had two hives right there and he said I know it, it came out of one of my hives and it was lo locally obtained so it, it's not a I wouldn't say well it's definitely not a feral swarm mm -hmm. but um, it, they will uh, well first they're mite free because mm -hmm. they just left and they left all the mites behind right when they <laughs> Shook flew them off up on into the, the tree yeah. right so I'm starting with a mite free uh, swarm and I have plenty of frames of honey from previous years, the yeah. year when my 11 colonies crashed, I had all this crystallized honey. So I've got honey I can feed them mm -hmm. and they should be all set for this year and they will build comb, they may right. maybe produce some honey um, and I'll, I'll have bees, I ex expect, that will go through the winter. Whether or not they're gonna persist I'm not so sure compared to the feral right. colony that I think I caught in July. Yeah, somebody had posted on one of the Facebook pages that they thought they'd spotted a swarm and that was just after I'd met you. And I know we tried to connect you. I don't know if that worked out or not. Oh, oh no, that didn't. Yeah, I think I re remember that. Yeah. Right. And someone else uh, picked it up and probably I think the, Good. the <laughs> person that uh, first reported it suspected where it had come from yeah. and, uh, and contacted that person That's good. and picked up this one. Yeah, because we can certainly on social media post contact information because it's a good way of sharing the information and hopefully gathering up some swarms. Yeah. Now, the whole idea of feral swarms mm -hmm. is controversial because I'm sure. <laughs> like almost everything in beekeeping, there's every different opinion and because a lot of people are so sure their way is the only way it, oh my <laughs> way or the highway um, right. <laughs> but so I've met several people oh that's crazy there's no feral swarms they were all wiped out by <laughs> the uh, varroa mite and and of course if you're a biologist you know that when there's um, selective pressure placed right. on an organism like a honeybee mm -hmm. There will be a crash. There will be um, the mites definitely took down most of the feral swarms mm -hmm. in Vermont and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. But there's always the remnant uh, genetic outlier right. that's able to deal with the honey with the uh, varroa mites mm -hmm. on their own, and that will persist and slowly build back. So right. I'm convinced that they're out there. And the other thing, there's your experience. Um, I have a friend in um, Sherbrooke, Quebec, and, and a fella mm -hmm. in Eden who have all told me that they had empty boxes sitting 
out in their bee yard right. and had a swarm move in from what appeared to be, you know, they don't know of any other beekeepers around. There, there's no indication that it was uh, from somebody else's yeah. hive. And also the time of year, early in the season, yep. if it's uh, a native wild uh, swarm or a colony, they build up early in the spring and they will swarm early. The ones that we bring in from Georgia are gonna be swarming about this time of year. Right. It takes them that long to build up. So anyway, all indications yeah. that um, they're feral. The other um, two uh, examples, one a fella told me about pool and lumber in North Troy had an old building that they were tearing down and replacing. And when they took the siding off, the whole inside of the wall was filled with honeycomb. Wow. Now I don't actually know, I don't even know if this fella knew whether there were live bees in there at the time, but the fact that there had been bees living sure. in that wall for a long time, Amazing. totally unmanaged. Another example, um, I got a call from a, a homeowner in Lowell, the same thing. They said, we had bees move in last fall and the we know we've had bees in this wall for at least 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. they, they'll move in, they'll live for a few years, and then, and then they'll, yeah. they'll die out apparently. Yeah. But the fact that uh, a swarm moved in, she insisted it was in October and then persisted through the winter. Obviously there was honey stored in that right. wall. And she said, we keep getting bees coming back. And I told her, yeah, actually, unless you take the siding off and remove everything that's bee that's related in there, <laughs> and maybe paint it with kills or something to, cool. um, to mask the smell, you're gonna keep getting bees moving in. So anyhow, from all these- It's actually a lovely smell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so from all these uh, indications, yeah. I'm convinced there are feral bees. Now, I don't think there's very many, and the main reason most people think is that there's just not the habitat for them to uh, nest into. The hollow trees, you know, Vermont apparently was just at one point just completely My cleared. neighbors had a beautiful, big, very old maple that was apparently hollow inside. We didn't know until it fell down. It just tipped completely. That was packed with bees. Ah. Uh, yeah, just another indication. Yeah. yeah. They're out there. But the bees that I'm insisting that moved into my hive were way smaller than the, quote, standard bees. Yeah. Uh, slightly different coloring. Yeah. They were not anybody's local bees. Right. And that's one measurement that uh, some people insist is an indication of the feral bees. And there's a, I think it's uh, five millimeters, 4.5 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Something under five millimeters is the uh, kind of breaking point between the, um, I guess you'd say the domesticated bees mm -hmm. and the feral bees. The feral yeah. bees tend to be smaller. Yeah. And that's a good reason for letting them make their own comb. Right. They will make it to the size that fits them. The other thing that uh, encourages me uh, is from this Facebook group. Mm -hmm. um, the number of people all across the country who say that they have been keeping bees for years, even decades, mm -hmm. without treatment. Right. The other thing, of course, is the uh, commercial beekeepers. They're, now, there's not very many, but there's a producer here in Vermont, and there's one just across the border in New Hampshire right. who have been doing beekeeping as a commercial business. Uh, they're honey producers. Mm -hmm. They make their living right. producing honey and producing bees for sale, and they have not treated their bees for mites in, in a decade or more. Right. In the one case, it's been over 20 years. So it can be done. Mm -hmm. And my personal feeling is the sooner we kind of bite the bullet and stop mm -hmm. putting chemicals in our hives to treat the mites, the right. sooner we will develop a line of bees in the genetics are resistant. that will. Well, the sooner we stop putting chemicals in just about everything we use, the healthier we will all become. Yeah. I and mean, we know that what we spray plants with takes out bees. But we keep on doing it. And you can go all the way back to Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. Yeah. When was that, the 1970s that she published that book? 60s. Yeah. Yeah. So Silent it's been that Spring. long. Yeah. Yeah, it was so stupid. Yeah. There's, there's lessons learned. Um, 
actually have a master's degree in pest management from Simon Fraser University. And the um, key they, the to the uh, education I got mm -hmm. was uh, integrated pest management and using all the possible strategies, minimizing the use of any kind of intervention. Mm -hmm. But the thing that uh, I find fascinating, you, you can take a, a difficult to grow crop, in my opinion, like apples. If you're trying to produce perfect apples, mm -hmm. flawless apples, and you pretty much need every tool in your toolbox right. to get to uh, that product. But with beekeeping, we have an organism that's perfectly capable of uh, managing their environment mm -hmm. on their own. Right. You know, th an apple tree can't really intervene and do something about the pests that might land on it, but mm -hmm. a honeybee can. And the uh, most interesting book I've uh, read on this subject was by Thomas Rinderer, I think that's how he pronounces his mm -hmm. name, but he was the USDA bee lab uh, scientist who first brought the Russian bees mm -hmm. in from Eastern Russia. But he's documented over 20 different ways that honeybees have to address varroa mites. Huh. Everything from biting their legs and pulling them off to uh, different, uh, oh, uh, uncapping and finding the mites and taking them off the larvae. Uh -huh. Anyway, there's at least 20 different behaviors or um, methods that the bees have found to address varroa mites. So there's all this possibility. I had a gentleman tell me, something like, well, of course I treat my honeybees for mites. I wouldn't let my dog, uh, I, I would always put a free co flea collar on my <laughs> dog. I'm always trying to keep fleas and ticks off of my dog. And I didn't think of it at the time, because mm -hmm. sometimes I don't think of these things. But later I thought, now wait a minute, when was the last time, you, you can see dogs kind of try to get fleas off, mm -hmm. but when was the last time a dog was able to completely remove all of the fleas and ticks by themselves? Right. And yet honeybees can do that. Mm -hmm. So the analogy it between work. <laughs> dogs and fleas and honeybees and right. varroa mites is not really a good analogy. No, and we've also been so seduced as a, as a human species into believing that chemical intervention is the answer to everything. You know, something doesn't work, you fix it with a pharmaceutical product. Yeah. It works great for the pharmaceutical company, but it doesn't do so well for all of us. And I'm not minimizing that some chemicals can be life-saving. Yeah. But we're a little too liberal. And just like with human nutrition, a lot of um, the natural way to maintain our own personal health Right is through diet, perhaps supplements, right. and um, nutrition. It's the same with honeybees. And you know, there's a lot of recent research on the value of a varied diet for mm -hmm. honeybees. So for example, if they're foraging only on white Dutch clover, they're not likely to be as healthy as they have a much more, as they would if they varied had a much diet. more varied diet right. from a, a variety of different flowers and nectar sources. Right. And I actually find Vermont to be a remarkably great place to keep honeybees because we have such a uh, continuous bloom through the years. You know, we start with uh, some of the tree uh, pollens that, uh, like uh, red maple mm -hmm. and uh, some of the other maples, and then the dandelions come right. on early. About the time the dandelions start to slow down a little bit, we have crab apples mm -hmm. and, and the uh, other apple trees. Uh, there's basswood, there's uh, milkweed, mm -hmm. and it just carries us right through. Other places have what they call a dearth, where there'll be a gap in flower nectar sources mm -hmm. sometime during the year, and the bees will either start to take down some of their stored resources or some people will need, feel a need to do some supplemental feeding, but I don't think we have that. And, you know, we've had droughts here in uh, mm -hmm. Newport, but they never seem to last that long. Even as far, as close, as nearby as Montpelier, I right. think, has had a much longer and more serious drought than, than I've experienced mm -hmm. in my six years here in Newport. We've had, you know, these brief spells, but we always seem to get some timely rain. 
Right. So I've never felt like there was uh, a, a gap in the uh, nectar sources. And then we finished with such a great flourish with the uh, goldenrod <laughs> bloom. In abundance. Yeah. And it's everywhere. <laughs> and and it's so heavy. And yeah. some people don't like it. And have you you've you've noticed the, I would even call it an odor, I guess, that you get from the goldenrod. Mm -hmm. And the first time I found that, because I, I had never kept bees where there was so much goldenrod. Mm. But the first time I smelled that, I thought, oh, dear, there's there's something wrong with my bees. You know, there's bees dying and they're, they're uh, decaying in the hive because it smells like dirty socks, kind mm -hmm. of. Or, uh, it's goldenrod. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I have actually learned to enjoy it. Right. And <laughs> I don't even notice it anymore. To me, it's a sign that they're uh, thriving. To, to smell that goldenrod. Yeah. They're bringing in that nectar and yeah. drying it down. And then other people also have said, well, goldenrod honey, you know, I can't stand it. I actually love it. There is, you do have to kind of get used to, because even the honey will have a little bit of that yes, kind of uh, it does. unpleasant smell, but the taste is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It does crystallize easily, but right. I, I, I will use it like a spread, you know. Yeah. So I don't mind that even. Half of my garden is intended to be a habitat, so I have plenty of goldenrod growing there for that reason. Yeah. yeah. It appalls some of my neighbors, but you know. <laughs> oh, I love it. I think it's great. I love to see it. So what about the nuts part of your business? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole another story. but. Um, as a forester, I worked on a big project, it would have been about 30 years ago, to um, promote the idea of planting tree seeds instead of tree seedlings. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, there was a shortage of bottomland hardwoods, and that would be several species of oaks, walnut, pecan, um, and hickory that grow in floodplains and uh, wet soils. Mm -hmm. They're relatively unusual, and there was a shortage of seedlings. And somebody said, well, we have all these trees that are producing seed, why don't we just plant the seed this year? Mm -hmm. um, so we ramped up to collect seed. There's a very um, efficient device that will roll across a grassy area and pick up seeds. It was developed to pick up golf balls but uh, <laughs> it's got these little plastic uh, fingers kind of, and the yeah. nuts will fit in there, and then it pops into a basket. So the short story is we found a, a really useful little tool mm -hmm. um, that's uh, lightweight and easy to use to pick up uh, seed. And it was actually my wife. I said something to her about, yeah, we're picking up a lot of seed to plant trees. And she said, you know, I wonder if somebody could sell those seeds to tree nurseries. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I don't see why not. So we tried it, and uh, it, it's uh, developed over the years. We've lived in Illinois, Michigan, North Carolina, and now Vermont. Mm -hmm. And in each place, there was a different uh, group or suite of um, oak trees sure. that you could pick up uh, seed and sell uh, to nurseries. So we've, we've sold to tree nurseries, we've sold to uh, seed companies, and we've sold to individual uh, landowners that just wanted to plant some sure. acorns on their property. When we moved here, when we moved here to uh, Newport, my first thought was, "Oh, we're in kind of the northern hardwoods now, and even the northern conifers." And I wonder if there are any oak trees. And then it was There's only <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was only uh, a few weeks into our stay here that I not only saw red oaks, but these yeah. enormous, huge red oaks over yeah. by the hospital in Bluff Road. You know, right. <laughs> So I said, honey, I think we could pick up uh, red oak acorns here. So we, we've done that. Our best year actually was two years ago, and we picked up 4,700 pounds of red oak acorns. So over two tons That's of red lot. oak acorns. And what we'll do is uh, sort them. The first step is actually to float them because the, um, best, the sound seed, the good seed, is solid and will sink if it's gotten an insect into it. Mm -hmm. and there's a very common weevil sure. that will eat the uh, acorns. If it's gotten uh, 
the uh, insect into it, they hollow it out a little bit and it floats. Mm. So the good seed sinks and the bad <laughs> seed, seed floats. So our first, first cut is to just throw the seed into a tub of water, skim off the floaters, and then throw the uh, sinkers onto a screen and let them dry a little bit. We do a little bit more sorting because sometimes the seed will be damaged mm -hmm. and still sink, but it's not good. Right. And it, we'll also pick up a little bit of gravel or some sure. other foreign uh, substance. Right. So we bodies. sort one more time and then just bag them up and put them in sturdy cardboard boxes and we've Ship got a out. network of buyers and it's different every year. Some nurseries, oh, we have plenty this year locally, we don't need any seed and, and others will call, no, it's a bust this year, you know, how much can you send us? That kind of thing. So what are you doing besides red oak? Actually, in uh, here in Vermont, that's all we've really been yeah. able to find in any abundance. Now, I've noticed that I've kind of, because I'm always, you know, looking around and tree ID was something I did sure. a lot of training on. So I've seen, I found some uh, local bur oak species and yeah. some individual trees. And I'm kind of keeping an eye on them this year because it looks like they will have a good crop. Good crop. Sure. And it, the oaks are, the oak species are often kind of out of sync with each other and, mm -hmm. and that's maybe not an accident. In other words, that there's uh, some advantages to that for the trees. If they produce a heavy acorn crop every year, the squirrel pop population would explode, <laughs> the uh, insect population would explode. So they go through years, several years sometimes, where mm -hmm. there will be virtually no acorns. And then they'll have a huge year and just drop, you know, a lot of acorns all at once. And that's mm -hmm. when we get all of our natural regeneration to occur. That's when we get, you know, all these seedlings right. come up and uh, fill in any gaps in the forest. But there's uh, two large groups of oak species, the red oak group and the white oak group. And bur oak is in the white oak group. And they tend to be out of sync with each other hmm. uh, so that they can probably, you know, uh, not have competition. Right. And uh, so it does look like a, a poor year this year for red oak, but a big year perhaps bur oak so I'm going to be kind of cool. watching to see and they're very very different trees the bur oak is one of the most long-lived trees mm -hmm. red oak is a long-lived tree but you know an old red oak is maybe 200 300 years old occasionally they'll reach maybe four even 500 years but it's very common for a bur oak to live five to seven hundred years they're the more long-lived of mm -hmm. the two species and their acorns are very different the red oak has a uh, high tannic acid, acid content and is bitter mm -hmm. when it first hits the ground. Over the winter with the uh, snow and you know rain and everything, a lot of that tannic acid, it's water soluble, so mm -hmm. it, it leaches out slowly. So red oak acorns will often sit on the ground uneaten by the typical uh, acorn feeding wildlife right. because it's so bitter and it sweetens up over the winter. So it becomes their survival mm. food that's still there in February, March, April. It's interesting. Where the white oak, including bur oak, has a very low tannic acid yeah. uh, content and it is just yummy. It's like ice cream for the wildlife. So they just gobble that up when it hits the ground. And, then there's and that left. gets them through the early part yeah. of the winter. And then the red oak acorns are there we're the last part of the winter. Nature's and much smarter it, than we are. It's amazing. You know, the more we study this stuff. Yeah. But you know, something that's been studied uh, for decades by better minds than mine <laughs> is what triggers these heavy mask years where acorns will just cover the ground. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and what sets up this uh, sequence in this... Right. Um, what do they know that we don't? Yeah. And why this year do we have so many crab apples? It's so complex that they've never sorted it out. Yeah. So there are clues. Um, a frost in the spring will kill mm -hmm. the flower buds and they won't produce acorns. Um, there needs to be a certain amount of uh, carbohydrate storage to occur. Mm -hmm. If the tree produced a heavy acorn crop every year, it would deplete so much of its energy that it, it couldn't thrive. So it has to store up energy for at least a few years in order to produce this big acorn crop. Uh, so there's those kind of things. And then there's the acorn cycle, I mean the insect cycles. Right. The weevil that destroys the acorns 
will build up, and then when there's no acorns for several years, it'll crash. The squirrel population, there's all of these different factors, and they've tried, even with you know, all our great computers and, uh, and the way we can process data, they've tried to enter all these factors in and try to predict mm -hmm. heavy acorn crops. And can't. And can't. It's amazing. <laughs> it's more complex than we've been able to. It's amazing. Sort out. We unfortunately are out of time. Ah. But I would love to pick this up again at another time. Sure. It's really interesting. Yeah. There's whole uh, fields of study. I, I actually knew and worked with uh, a fellow who his title was um, seed biologist. Mm -hmm. So he's a forester by training. Sure. But he specialized into just tree seed. Really interesting. So thank you so much for coming in. My and pleasure. Let's do this again. Very good.